Hello, I'm Otis Brawley of Johns Hopkins University, and I'm one of the co-editors of the Cancer History Project, along with Paul Goldberg, and uh, we're staffed by Katie Goldberg. I want to welcome you to this evening's discussion, where we're going to talk about cancer centers and the history of cancer in the United States, especially since the National Cancer Act. You know, it was in December of 1971 that Richard Nixon signed the National Cancer Act. There was a lot of buildup politically throughout the 1950s and 60s in order to sign the National Cancer Act. And now 50 years later, after we look at what many refer to as Nixon's war on cancer, it's time for an after action report where we sit back and assess where we've come from, what we've done, and that's how we figure out where we're going in the future. I want to welcome uh, all the viewers. We're an international audience. There are people from the United States, people from Canada, people from as far away as Australia who are viewing us this evening. We have some wonderful guests. These are three of the leaders in oncology today, uh, three amazing physicians, and I know them all personally, amazing human beings who lead three of the great cancer centers of our time. They're going to talk to us today a little bit about cancer centers, the National, uh, the National Cancer Act, and tell us a little about, maybe give us a glimpse as to where cancer research and cancer care is going into our future. And so you've seen the introductions of Dr. Candace Johnson of Roswell Park, uh, Dr. Craig Thompson of Memorial Sloan Kettering, and Dr. Peter Pisters of uh, at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Thank you uh, for joining us today. Uh, I, I must say, being with the three of you, I do feel like Forrest Gump. Uh, you are all incredibly distinguished in your own right, and you run amazing organizations that have contributed so much and are and will contribute so much uh, in the fight against cancer. Uh, Let's start out a little bit talking about the history of cancer centers. Uh, what is a cancer center and how did they get founded is where I think we should start out with. And let me start with you ladies first. Dr. Johnson, Roswell Park. Uh, I know Roswell Park himself was a surgeon, but I don't even know if he founded the institution. I've heard it referred to as New York State Institute for the Study of Malignant Disease, catchy name, by the way. But tell us a little about Roswell Park and where it came from. The Roswell Park, you got to remember, uh, this was in 18, uh, eight, late 1800s, so this was 1898, somewhere around in there. And uh, Buffalo, New York was the second largest city in the country. So, um, you know, that's obviously not true now, but we were the, uh, the Erie Canal. I mean, this was a really booming place. Uh, if you look in our downtown, lots of uh, incredible architects built uh, wonderful buildings here. And with the Renaissance, we're trying to bring that back. So this was uh, a, a site of much commerce and uh, activity. And so Roswell Park was a surgeon he did found uh, the New York uh, State Institute for the Study of Malignant Disease. He was a, really a Renaissance man. And, uh, and actually Roswell Park IV just passed away during COVID, not of COVID. He was a longtime multiple myeloma survivor um, and succumbed to the disease during COVID, but he was Roswell Park IV. He was a professor at Buff State. So we have a long history of Roswell Park, uh, the family. And he, he was very, um, thought out of the box. He really thought the way we we're gonna understand this disease was to study it, sort of the beginnings of translational research, if you were. And you know, if you, in 1898, you were more likely to die of an infectious disease than cancer perhaps, but he really saw a real need for this. And he also thought, uh, and this was very revolutionary for the time, that the government should support this research. And it really goes to the tenet of how a prominent role Roswell Park played in that because he was very well connected uh, to the president, to President Taft at the time, and really advocated uh, for, for government support for research uh, in cancer. Now, over the years, you've had some amazing people there. I, I remember from uh, 
you're, you're a basic scientist, so I'm going to dabble just a little bit. I remember a little bit of basic science about glucose being converted to glycogen. As I recall, the Corys, a married couple at Roswell Park, won the Nobel Prize for that, right? Yeah, they did. And, and you know, it, Roswell was supported by New York State, uh, hence... Um, uh, significantly so uh, during those early years. And it really, there were a lot of very uh, famous people that um, did their training here. We still have a summer program and, you know, little Roswell Park in Buffalo, New York has trained, people spent summers uh, at Roswell Park in this training program and then went on to be uh, leaders in, in the field. And so it's really, we played a big part in that. Uh, PSA was discovered here, uh, Ming Chu and uh, Dr. Yang uh, developed it, the same sort of the test, if you will, that Hybertech use, uses today. Um, in fact, the, the tech transfer people uh, will say it was one that got away because uh, we didn't use <laughs> it. I mean, can you imagine? We wouldn't have to worry about the N NCI um, uh, because of, of the times. Uh, it, was a, it was an invention that perhaps got away. But, you know, uh, we have played a very prominent role in smoking cessation. I don't think people sort of realize uh, there was a gentleman in, in 1938, Dr. Levin, Morton Levin, who really was uh, made it his life's work to, to the evils of cancer and tobacco and their correlation with cancer. And we were very prominent in getting tobacco out of bars and restaurants in New York State. And then the Human Genome Project where um, the back arrays that were sort of the foundation for the Human Genome Project were from a Buffalonian. And so a strong history in genetics. So yeah, we've had, uh, you know, we've, we've been a player. The, the um, AACR was um, uh, two of the founding members that started AACR. Uh, came from Roswell Park. They were Roswell Park uh, physicians and scientists. And uh, the first meeting of AACR uh, was held here in Buffalo, New York. And so, you know, we've, uh, we have uh, our connection to sort of the history of cancer and cancer research is strong. Now, this idea of research and uh, clinical care coming together, that too was done at Roswell Park, right? Okay. The hospital and the clinics. Most definitely. And, and I think, you know, we were uh, we were probably one of the first centers to really not just treat cancer, um, but to really to, to try to understand it and uh, do research around it so that we could figure it out and treat uh -huh. it. Uh -huh. now, Dr. Craig Thompson, uh, you're at Memorial Sloan Cancer, the oldest private cancer center in the world, I am told. Uh, tell us a little about the start of Memorial Sloan Kettering, because it started, too, at about the same time as uh, Roswell Park, as I believe. Uh, that's right, Otis. So um, Memorial Sloan Kettering was formed, actually, in a slightly different way than Candace talked about. Um, it was a group of physicians in 1880 that came together with uh, some of the philanthropists in New York with the understanding that even though this was, as Candace just said, the dawn of the microbial revolution, where we understood viruses and bacteria cause disease, the cancer seemed to them as a group of seven physicians to be somewhat different and that it needed its own research. And they got the philanthropic community because a number of well-off families had been touched by cancer themselves. And it had this scare to it that it could occur, it seemed in any organ. And there was dysfunction in that organ and it wasn't attached to the microbial revolution. So we were able to raise, I think at the time, $3 million and proposed to build a hospital dedicated to cancer. Now, I should say that because there's international visitors, we weren't the first private hospital in the world. We modeled ourselves off of the Royal Marsden, which was the very first. It was started in 1865, if I remember the career correctly. And they came together as a cancer research hospital over exactly the same reason. And New Yorkers believed we should have exactly the same thing in New York. So our mission was to understand this disease, to put it on the map. And we would do that through a, what is our tripartite mission, which is research, clinical care, and education. And then we meant education in the broadest sense. Train those people that would do the research and the clinical care, as Candace just said, and prove that by understanding the disease, we could provide better clinical care. That led to our clinical trial efforts. And then education, we are proud every year of the 3,000 trainees 
um, that come through Memorial Sloan Kettering and exposed to the best of cancer research care and go out into the community and practice it throughout the world. And so we're very proud of our alumni. Um, the hospital was originally on Central Park West. The original hospital still exists on 104th, 105th Street. It was actually built with round rotundas because they weren't really sure that it wasn't a virus or a bacteria. So they built a hospital with round rooms so there were no corners for microbes to, to link in. That was the, our proud first hospital. Um, our original hospital was read by surgeons and pathologists, just as Candace said. Um, the, the leader of that group was William Coley. He was a sarcoma surgeon. Um, he actually um, was the founder of Coley's toxins and the idea that immunotherapy would make a difference. And in 1890, he launched our first dedicated research program into immunotherapy, starting with Coley toxins. We continued that continuously through its work on Lloyd Old and BCG to our most recent work where Jim Allison realized checkpoint blockade, brought it into the clinic uh, with other physicians here and to its most recent iteration, CAR T cells led by um, Michelle Satellane and Re Isabel Riviera. So um, he was visionary at the very start, but he was at heart a surgeon. It was his care of a young woman in, who was in 19 years old who had osteosarcoma, we believe, that led the Rockefeller family to be devoted to the institution. At, he, she was the closest friend of John Rockefeller Jr. And uh, they were devastated with the loss of this close friend of their son. And they became the base of our philanthropy ever since and brought people to the community, ultimately with Lawrence Rockefeller becoming our chairman for many, many decades. Um, over the years, uh, we started with surgery and pathology. Our first three chairmen are well known to everybody. I talked about Coley. The second was James Ewing, Ewing sarcoma. He was a pathologist. He put the pathology of cancer on the map. He wrote the first definitive pathology text of the diversity of cancer. And then that his, the third was actually a practicing surgeon, Peter will know well, and that was Alan Whipple, who, who's best known for the Whipple procedure and pancreatic cancer as we went forward. We weren't only surgery though. In 1911, Madame Curie won the, her second Nobel Prize, which was really for the application of the understanding of radiation and its use in various modalities of therapy. And one that she championed was its use in medicine. And we hired one of her first trainees in, in the translation of radiation science um, to start a unit here at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, I'm not sure where that would have gone except that we were benefited by someone who took the opportunity to bring his daughter. He was a mining engineer from Denver. His name was James Wallace, uh, James Douglas, excuse me. And his daughter had breast cancer. She had surgery out in the West, didn't do well. He brought her here to the surgeons at Memorial Sloan Kettering, unfortunately also didn't go well, and then took her to, to Madame Curie in Europe to see if radiation would help. Unfortunately for that young woman, it also didn't go well and she died of breast cancer. But he became devoted because his mining included radium mining in the Denver area. And he committed to Memorial that all the radium he mined would come to Memorial. And between 1917 and 1926, Memorial had more radium than all the rest of the world combined <laughs> sent to us. And, it was ultimately Madame Curie's visit first to, to Candace's center, to our center, to Fox Chase, where she brought the one remaining ounce. We had nine ounces, but she brought one more ounce that was bought by the U.S. government, who also wanted to play in this. At that point, we became known as a radium hospital. And it was the, the we dedicated a quarter of the institution to exploring whether radiation could improve cancer therapy. First, it was whole body radiation. Patients were put in the room with radium. But fortunately, one of our first faculty that was recruited in 1917, Edith Quimby, who is a legend in the early stages of radiation therapy, stood, started brought out the first radiation dosing tables and standardized what the doses were that each tissue could take. And from that, she also, because she understood you could encapsulate radiation, made the first brachytherapy program. So we're very proud of that and what Edith did. That's had a long tradition in radiation therapy since then. 
We were the first center to use computers to plan the ability to deliver radiation. And from that came IMRT in the later years and more recently proton therapy. And we've had a great tradition ever since Edith put it on the roll to the rational and scientific use of radiation. Medical oncology, like for many of us, came to us after World War II with people that actually came back to New York, haven't been in, a, in unfortunately, in the uh, chemical warfare research department and came back to said, we wanna do this research for something good. Using the example of must, nitrogen mustard gas started experimental chemotherapeutic program as a result. And that has continued on to this day and is the formation of our medical oncology. We were able at that time to recruit Lois Miller to start our pediatric program. And so we had all of those programs in full place uh, when the Cancer Center Act came and it allowed us to have all three of the major modalities to do our clinical research and to inform our basic science research at the time. We've been incredibly proud of our, also our ability, our scope to be able to bring additional therapies to bear on cancer from Jimmy Holland's pioneering work uh, to start uh, uh, psycho-oncology and to build the understanding of the psychologic support that cancer patients need on, um, er, the end of life work uh, that Kathy Foley and others did uh, around the use of opioids to, to deal with cancer pain and the end products of that. We're, uh, and then more recently, the basic research that got us to underpinning, I'll just speak to one because it's what everybody knows. One of our first chairman of the department was in fact, Charlotte Friend of Friend Leukemia Virus. And she is actually the first person to ever show that differentiated therapy, differentiation therapy could actually accuse cancer. I think I, I, I'm really nervous about saying what's currently going on. We've been proud to be with my two compatriots here, part of precision medicine, part of the immuno-oncology revolution, part of the robotic surgery, part of proton therapy. Um, and I, if I mention one faculty, I'll get in trouble because I won't mention them all. We're very proud though that they've received recognition as was just said by Candace, 17 of our faculty are members of the National Academy of Science, 25 of them are members of the National Academy of Medicine. Because in the end, we balance the hospital which is the here and now to help and give hope to patients that actually face the disease of their hair. And we, our research is the future. It gives us the knowledge to engage in something you care about, Otis, which is prevention and to improve diagnosis and treatment, which is why freestanding cancer centers have existed since we started in 1884. You, you know, as I hear about uh, uh, the early radiation therapy studies, you, you're, start, you're starting to rattle my definition of translational research because it really was translational. Exactly. <laughs> we didn't call it that in the 1920s. Of course, you and I didn't call it anything in the right. 1920s. But anyway, <laughs> Dr. Pisters, uh, your institution was founded by a cotton magnet, I understand. That's Tell right. us a little about MD Anderson and the early history of MD Anderson. Well, our history goes back to World War II when presumably uh, the Texas legislature had been watching potentially for decades, the innovation going on in New York State in Buffalo and in New York. And the legislature at that time voted to create a state cancer hospital that would be devoted to research, uh, to cancer treatment and position that cancer hospital under the jurisdiction of the University of Texas and its board of regents. And the hospital, as you alluded to, Otis, received tremendous support from Monroe Dunaway, who was a cotton merchant, and he dedicated his business fortune for a series of charitable causes, including cancer. And so following his death, the hospital was named after him in recognition of the foundation's support and the wisdom of the legislature. MD Anderson himself um, is clearly recognized as one of the fathers of the Texas Medical Center, uh, with a center that is now viewed as the largest medical center in the world and includes institutions such as MD Anderson, Texas Children's Hospital and Methodist. And the initial MD Anderson facility was housed at the Baker Estate, um, as in James Baker. This was James Baker's grandfather, who was a lawyer in Houston. And he donated his estate 
to create the first location for MD Anderson, which was in downtown Houston. And then MD Anderson moved to its present location where all of you probably know um, in the Texas Medical Center in 1954 um, during R. Lee Clark's tenure as president. Um, my predecessors, um, Clark, um, Lemaitre, Mendelssohn, and DePino, have really transformed MD Anderson in ways that I think hopefully all of our viewers know and understand. Uh, we're known for world-class cancer treatment, for research, for education, and also for the wisdom of Dr. Lemaitre, who inserted prevention into our mission statement. That was a quarter of a century ago, and we've made great strides um, in the science of prevention, in implementation science, and so many other aspects of how prevention could transform society. All of us know that if we could succeed in prevention, we could put ourselves out of business. And so as we look at so many of the innovations that came out of MD Anderson, there are probably too many to summarize um, today, but I think one of the most important was the creation of multidisciplinary care centers that were organized around diseases. This was innovative. It aggregated groups of specialists around unique patients with specialized diseases, and that became a prototype for comprehensive cancer care delivery around the world. We're also known for deep fusion, deep integration of clinical care and research. And that, I think, creates the opportunities for discovery. It supercharges physician scientists who have opportunities to learn at the bedside and take questions back to the lab. And I think that um, is part of our secret sauce and one of the reasons that we've been consistently identified as a top cancer center. When we look at the impact on society, there's so many ways that that could be measured. Uh, one, one measurement might be FDA oncology drug approvals. And if we look back over the last 15 years, um, MD Anderson has participated in one way, shape, or form in the approval of 116 out of 251 oncology drug approvals. So it is literally the case um, that today, um, on Thursday, patients are receiving treatment at MD Anderson that will be approved by the FDA six months from now or a year from now. Uh, we're proud of what we've accomplished, and look forward to taking a lot of the advances that Craig and Kenneth have talked about and driving an exciting future for cancer patients going forward. You, you know, uh, I just get a little bit emotional when you talk about your predecessors. Rhonda Pino is a personal friend and John Mendelson and Mickey LeMater were also very good friends and mentors of mine. Uh, you come from a long lineage of just amazing leaders. Now, the three of you are at the top of your game running leading cancer centers. I want to ask you, and you sort of delved into it a little bit, Peter, uh, some cancer centers are matrix and very heavily integrated in university hospitals. Some cancer centers are freestanding institutes as yours are. Let's talk about, I'm going to ask something that's, that's this is not, that this is sort of devilish of me. What's the advantage of a matrix center versus a, a center that's freestanding? Anybody want to jump in on that? I'll oh. jump in because I, <laughs> I came from the uh, University of Pittsburgh, very much a matrix cancer center. Um, I think uh, I think all of us on this uh, panel would say the advantage of a freestanding center is you have more control. You're not competing with all the other disciplines that are in a medical school uh, for resources, and and you're sort of. Uh, and the hospital and matrix centers is many times owned by a different corporation, and so you're fighting with that uh, as well. Um, but I think the advantage of a matrix center is you have sort of, you know, all of us, um, and especially for me, I, you know, we're in a small market. Uh, we're not, uh, we don't have it perhaps as many uh, uh, deep pockets and endowments as, as the, uh, my other two uh, gentlemen here on this panel. And so for us, we're sort of out there. So we have to, we have to survive and, and not only survive, we have to succeed and do really well on what we can bring to the table uh, because we don't have the luxury of being a matrix center and having sort of the safety of the medical school or the university. And so I think uh, it, it's a different, um, uh, it's a, it, it, matrix centers are different. They have advantages too, because we're all cancer here. Um, everybody, every person in this institution thinks, breathes, lives cancer. 
regardless of, uh, of where they come, come at it. Um, the advantage of a matrix center is you, you know, you have those engineering folks or those, uh, the structural biologists where you can really, uh, I mean, I always thought it was really fun to sort of get into some of that stuff. Um, looking at, uh, because I was a pharmacologist in my research life and looking at how um, uh, uh, those structure function analysis, analysis happens. We don't have that here at Roswell Park. So I think an advantage of a matrix center is, is putting together, is you have more depth and breadth across all different disciplines. I'd still rather be a free a freestanding center. And so, I bet you two guys would agree with that. So what I'll, I'll, I'll chime in after Candace, uh, because in fact, uh, I started in the cancer center business as a director of a cancer center that was a matrix cancer at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, there are a couple of huge advantages that speak to what Peter talked about at the end of his presentation. Particularly academic medical centers that are a matrix with a matrix cancer center have a one tremendous advantage that we don't have and that is a primary care network and they have a public health uh, mandate and usually a public health service, such as the department that you work in at uh, John Hopkins Otis. And that gives you the ability to reach out with the knowledge, the understanding we have to get at what all of our goal. The goal of every three, all three of our freestanding institutions is to put ourselves out of business. And if we can do that through understanding and better therapies so that we don't need to exist, our faculty and staff will be thrilled that they accomplished a mission that we've been at for 134 years. But that being said, um, there is a huge advantage to focus. And that focus has allowed us, particularly in the field that you're in, Otis, to actually become the authority for our region. So when the city wants to have new laws on tobacco restriction, I can go to city council with the authority of our 137 year of history to say we have got all the documented evidence that preventing tobacco addiction is absolutely an essential thing that the government needs to do and be that authority. We can be the group that has the resources as Candid said to focus on, does it make a difference now that we know that polyps are pre-malignant to actually have a colonoscopy program as Sid Winower and Ann Zauber did. And so we can be the authority and convene others to do that, to do a clinical trial that has gone on for 25 years. And we're very proud, just changed the guidelines to 45 years as the screening time is. Sadly, we've seen colorectal cancer move earlier and earlier. We can pick our moments to do that. And then one of the most exciting projects that's come out of that authority in the, in, during my time as the president was to realize that the largest healthcare workforce that is not coalesced around a major cancer that is increasing incidence are dentists. Dentists see everybody in the city and everyone in our catchment areas mouth. There are 40,000 dentists in New York City that actually are seeing people's mouths, coalescing them through our CME programs, through a research program uh, that Jamie Ostroff runs to train them in the standard of practice and do a trial to do early detection and early prevention of oral lesions has been tremendous because it was an untapped resource. And as the convening authority, we could involve clinical trials like that, get the support of the NCI and make it a model for how to do. And that's an advantage of a freestanding institution. I think Craig and Candice have made great points and um, I can double click on a couple of them just for emphasis. Uh, and I think my experience obviously comes back to being a CEO in a matrix environment with Princess Margaret, Toronto General, Toronto Western, a rehab institute, um, and in affiliation with the University of Toronto. And the clear benefit of the matrix environment, as Candace was alluding to, is that you've got a rich ecosystem um, that, and you can be a beneficiary of the talent and the resources, and the infrastructure at the university. And that can foster tremendous collaboration and lots of opportunities. On the other side of the ledger in the matrix environment is the dynamic tension and funds flow, oftentimes between the health system CEO, the medical school dean, and the cancer center director, who um, have somewhat aligned agendas, but not always. And that can create tensions um, in an environment where the cancer center director has to compete with the organ transplant program, the cardiovascular program, the neuroscience program, and where institutionally at an enterprise level, there isn't the fidelity and clarity on mission. 
um, that you see um, in a cancer center that is uh, separated from the university environment. When you look at the current situation I'm in, one of the benefits that we talk about internally is that we're not a university and we're not a medical school. And so we can shed ourselves of many of the funds flow issues, the internal politics associated with that, and we can focus on making cancer history. And I think as we look closely internally, we have the benefit of, of not having those politics and we have the fidelity and clarity around what is it that we're actually here to do. And as we think about that internally and we talk about it, it's symbolized by the cancer strike through. It's put into words by making cancer history. Everyone in our institution, all 22,000 of our employees understand why we're here. It doesn't matter if you're a valet parker, a top shelf neurosurgeon, a researcher, a laboratory technician, or a CEO, everyone knows this is why we're here. And when you have that fidelity and clarity, you can drive deep engagement uh, ar around purpose and meaning and work. And that really is a lot of the special sauce that exists in independent cancer center environments where you're free from a lot of the politics, funds flow, and you can focus on what's important. Great. Great, great. Now I want to note to the audience, uh, the Q&A function is open. And if you have any questions for any of our guests here, please go ahead and add, uh, just write in the Q&A. I will read the questions uh, as they come in, or we might bunch, a bu uh, bunch some of them together uh, toward the end of our two hour session here. Uh, I want to point out, we now know who MD Anderson is. We now know who Roswell Park. Since I'm from Detroit, I'm going to let folks know. This is a Jeopardy question, I'm sure. Uh, Sloan and Kettering were General Motors money. Kettering actually is the guy who created the modern day automobile starter. So you didn't have to get out in front of the car and crank the car up as you might see in some old, old movies, the old silent movies. Now, let's get back to on point. Cancer centers, uh, you're, at the time of the National Cancer Act, your three centers were consensus comprehensive cancer centers. You need not apply. Everybody just accepted that you guys were the cream de la cream. Uh, how have cancer centers evolved over time? And, and I would actually, I'm gonna say this, you guys don't have to. Many other institutions have tried to become like you. But anyway, to just talk a little bit about the evolution of cancer centers and how they have changed over time. So, so I think that, you know, one of the uh, tenets of the cancer center program and uh, the National Cancer Act was cancer, it's a complex disease. I think it was even um, acknowledged uh, back in the 70s that this was not going to be an easy um, easy disease to treat. It was very multifactorial and different in every organ and so forth. And so um, you needed to go, you needed to have centers of excellence uh, for innovative treatment, research, therapies. And so it was thought that these centers should be within a day's drive of every American. And so if you look at a map, now in the early days in the 70s, uh, they were uh, focused predominantly on the East uh, because of the centers of um, uh, activity. But um, if you look at a map today, there is, even in the West, uh, if you, even if you live in Montana, you're within a day's drive an, of an NCI designated center. And what it says to an American is that those centers, um, they're gonna know what to do with your cancer. And you're gonna, you can, uh, so, so you may be treated in your community, but you maybe should, you should go to one of those NCI designated centers and make sure that there, there's not something that you're missing or there's not some treatment uh, that you could avail yourselves of. And I think all of us, the other thing that I think is important is that of those NCI designated centers, we work very well together. Um, I know because Craig and I are not too far away, we're at both ends of the state. And there will be people that um, we have sent to Memorial because they have things that we don't have. But we have also gotten patients sent from Memorial to Roswell because they're, they live closer to us and we have things that Memorial doesn't have, 
or we could, they know um, that they could be treated here just as effectively. And so we do share. I mean, I, I get that, I get asked that from so many people. We do share, we do work together. And I think we do this for the betterment of all patients with cancer around this country. And so I think that's, to me, um, the, one of the real significance of the National Cancer Act is establishing these centers of excellence in cancer. Because look at other diseases, you don't have this. Right, so our research mission, as Candace said, and you just alluded to Otis, was put on its legs, really between 1935 and 45, when GM was the largest corporation in the world. Their headquarters were 10 blocks from us. And um, Alfred Sloan, their CEO, and Charles Kettering, who's their chief engineer, turned their attention to an unsolved problem. And as Candace just alluded to, we knew it was too complex. Surgery wasn't going to be the end all and be all cure. We needed additional things. And Charles Kettering was the proud man, okay, who not only had the starter, he invented the Slant 6, which was the <laughs> successful car block engine for everybody. They believed that if they funded our research institute and we left the researchers alone on their own, just like they invented a car, they would invent a therapy for cancer within five years. That's actually what was in the document. Um, unfortunately, although we need, as both Candace and Peter have said, those colleagues who are engineers and cellular engineering is the thing of, the, of today, we um, didn't achieve that because in fact, they both believed the Research Institute and Hospital had to be separated. And it took us until 1960, year, 1960, 15 years of separate governance, but overlapping governance of the two to realize they were best together. And so, in fact, in 1960, we formed the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center to combine the Sloan Kettering Institute and the hospital, Memorial Hospital for Cancer and Allied Disease, into one corporate entity where we drew on each other. And that was timely because we're in those next 10 years, we're going to be part of the backbone, as my two colleagues are, of the reason we needed a National Cancer Act. And so what we really learned from that research is why all the other diseases had national institutes that were succeeding and were getting more funding because they worked on an organ that had a physiology. So you could work on the heart and ask what did it do and what goes wrong when you have a heart attack? When, when you have an arrhythmia, what goes wrong with the conduction system? But cancer is just too sporadic. It occurs in every organ at the time in 1960. It wasn't amenable to, in most cases, as patients presented surgical care. We didn't have the diagnostic capability to do it early enough. And we were able to document that by having scientists take the latest physiologic techniques come together. And so the Cancer Act, we came together in 1960, the frustrations of coming. And I'll, I'll give you a, our history, our center grant, our Cancer Center Support Grant, started in 1964, four years after we came together. Because we just simply, no investigator, this is Peter's point of team-based science. So for us, team-based science started in 1960, when we realized we had to have the researchers and the clinicians working on the same platform in the same, and bumping into each other in the lunchroom and having those kind of conversations. Our center grant came because we had 54 funded NCI grants. And the NCI said, you're driving us crazy because you all want the same resources and made us bundle them all. We complained, it was so much paperwork. So this is, we think about the paperwork today, they were complaining in 1964, there was too much metal. And the NCI, at least according to our records, threw up their hands and said, fine, put them all in one center grant. And that gave us the resources to have cores that could support all of our clinicians all of our researchers to investigate human tissue, human biopsies, human cell line, our cell line program started then, and be able to focus on what now is the paradigm, the human as the subject, what the human natural disease is. I embarrassed myself when I came 10 years ago to Memorial, when they told me, we think cancer is 150 different diseases, because we've been part of the of the of the ATC of the of the cancer of the cancer sequencing projects. And I said, no, no, that's way too complicated. We can't have a hundred. We unequivocally know there's over 400 
entirely separable, need to be treated diseases that are called cancer today. So there isn't one organ, there isn't one physiology. And the timing of the Cancer Center Act, the three of us came together and said, we have to do this on a national level for the reason Candace said. So everybody has that hope that a freestanding cancer says within a short distance of their own home, a network allowed us to take advantage of the revolution that started also in 1971, which was molecular biology. And we are the poster child of how much molecular biology can deliver to human health with the TCGA, with the sequencing projects, the somatic mutations, the predisposition syndromes that have been figured out at a molecular level. That was all because of DNA sequencing the understanding of what molecular biology and now the therapies that molecular biology provides us to treat this disease. And so it was just very timely for us to come together to understand that the research and the clinical care had to be hand in hand. We had to handle the tissues carefully to understand this disease because it looked so diverse. And it allowed us to realize advantages that had happened in our basic research Rouse sarcoma virus, I'm looking at the building that Rouse sarcoma virus was discovered in at our sister institution, Rockefeller University. My predecessor, Harold Barmus, with his colleague, Mike Bishop, cloned the gene, which was a homologue of our own gene to launch the molecular error in the 1970s, the benefit of funding, that doubling of funding, because the National Cancer Act doubled the NCI's budget. For our junior colleagues, they'll be horrified. It went from $100 million to $200 million. And that was a, a revolution that allowed the molecular area of cancer research to start. And we, all three of us, and our colleagues, and all of our patients have benefited from that revolution over the last 50 years. Why we see cancer's mortality going down 1% a year, every year since 1990, and now it has accelerated in the last decade to 2% a year. You brought up a very important point. The NCI budget in 1971 was $200 million. Yeah. Today, it's about $6 billion. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Did I step on you, Dr. Pispers? Well, I'm going to say, Otis, taking into account that we have an international audience um, and looking at the benefit of history, um, I really believe uh, one thing that should be emphasized today is that by starting out with three exemplars and then by putting into place a set of criteria, this then became an aspirational goal for university presidents, um, medical school deans, and health system CEOs. And oftentimes that is really what led them on a pathway to create an NCI designated comprehensive cancer center. It infused the understanding of many of the complexities of cancer care delivery that Candace has really talked about and that Craig has really elaborated on. And it helped really to create geographic distribution um, that has been so beneficial to cancer patients. And I think that in the modern area, this has led to a degree of consumerism where the term cancer center is understood by lay people in, in fairly detailed terms uh, as a result of the fact that so many universities and medical schools really charted a pathway and put into strategic goals, spoke to philanthropists, talked to their community, and now we have an unbelievable network of 51 NCI-designated comprehensive cancer centers that benefit society in ways that um, don't exist, uh, frankly, in other countries. Is the expectation of the American people that a cancer center is both a place that treats and a place that does basic and translational research. Is, am, uh, am I right that people have come to expect that? I believe so. It'd be interesting to hear uh, what my colleagues think. I, I really believe that increasingly, particularly um, as we move past the AIDS epidemic and into uh, now a pandemic, people are understanding the value of medical research. Uh, now we're in an era where we can get a COVID vaccine generated and into people's arms in six months. These are unbelievable triumphs of science that the general public is becoming much more aware of and therefore hopefully continuing the longstanding bipartisan support for NIH funded. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. I, I, think, I think actually though, I wish that, um, I'm not sure we're always as as effective lobbyists for uh, uh, getting more money from the federal government for the NCI. I mean, I think 
you know, if you look over time uh, the, at the NCI budget uh, and the pay lines and so forth and, and is, uh, you know, it's gone up, it's gone down in my career. Um, I've seen lots of that. Sometimes it was stable. Um, and if you look at who was president, who was the in charge of the Congress at the time, you can't really correlate uh, excess uh, research dollars with any political affiliation because you could see on both sides of the spectrum, you can find where uh, we had prosperous times. And, and I think that when you talk to people um, at, in the federal government, they all support us. They all think what we do is wonderful. They all want more money. It's prioritizing. Are we gonna, and it, it's too easy to cut our budget. And I think we need to be more bold um, and maybe um, uh, the general public, um, especially coming out of COVID where research is so important can help us with that because I think we're not as, as good an advocate uh, as we could be um, to advocate for more dollars. So. Yeah, so so I agree with that, Otis. But just to add a, a little bit of color to what both, and I completely agree with what Candace and Peter said. I think the public does understand what comprehensive cancer centers. Um, uh, my chief operating officer when I first came here, John Gunn, used to say, "The biggest value of our cancer care is actually people seeing how many people are committed to the team that will make them better and find a new therapy." You come on our main campus and you see the number of people involved in research, you see the number of people involved in clinical care, and it gives patients and their caregivers hope. And that is a message that gets out into the community and it matters because we still don't, and it's to Candace's point, we haven't done a good enough job of explaining, yes, we have all these new tools, but we only have half the tools we really need to make cancer history as Peter just said in his dialogue, we still need funding, we'll still need research because of the complexity of the diseases that come under the rubric of cancer. We have to exist for rare cancers that no single community hospital or regional hospital even sees one of in a year. We have at each of the three centers, a clinic every afternoon of the week, seeing people from around the country to come for that combined expertise. At the same time, we have to see the common cancers for our training missions. And that often confuses people. Well, if I have a common cancer, why can't I go to my local cancer center? I can come to a comprehensive cancer center because you're participating in improving our knowledge about that. And we do need to be better at getting that communication. People, as Peter said, sometimes people think of cancer treatment just as a commodity. But it's, it's odd, it happens in these conversations that Candace is talking about, rather than when you actually talk to patients and their families, they really do understand the importance of this. The public's ability in philanthropy, we have averaged over my presidency a million donations a year, but the average donation is a couple hundred bucks. And that's the public, we don't touch that many people, people believe in the mission. George Gallup told me that in 2008 that the leading thing Americans now feel in health for their family is actually getting cancer. The World Health Organization doubled down that in 2012. It's the leading fear around the world in developing and, and, and developed nations. And so our opportunities to give hope through combining that expertise, the team-based research is a tremendous benefit. And we don't do enough to shine a light on it. I hope the cancer... History Project actually shines the light on that as we go forward. Thank you. I'll take that as an opportunity to do the one commercial of the two-hour interview. Uh, the Cancer History Project at cancerhistoryproject.com is a website free to anyone who wants it that allows people to go look at some of the sentinel events that have happened in cancer medicine, not just in the 50 years since the National Cancer Act, but in the history of cancer. You get to see things donated from various cancer centers and universities, various uh, distinguished scientists, archives of records so you can actually see um, the first protocol that looked at uh, lumpectomy and radiation versus uh, mastectomy, for example. You can read the actual protocol. Now that's for the commercial cancerhistoryproject.com. Um, Craig, you you really want me to go in two directions or, or you're, you're sort of <laughs> encouraging me to go in two directions. One, I wanna talk about how 
over the last 50 years, we and we as the cancer centers at the lead have really changed the definition of what cancer is. You know, it was, uh, people didn't realize it was a genetic disease in the 1950s and 60s. And right. many people thought it was metabolic, but we've, we've talk a little bit about that. You're, you're, you're a, a true basic scientist. Talk about how the definition of what cancer is has evolved that you mentioned the 400 different diseases. Explain that to the lay person a little bit. So I think a couple of major insights have come in the last 50 years. First of all, the discovery, as I mentioned by Harold Varmus and Mike Bishop of oncogenes, genes that drive proliferation and survival of cells that are recurrently mutated to define certain classes of genes. And so they come as a large group, the kinases, but each individual cell and each individual cell type relies on a different member of that family. And so you have to treat relative to what's driving this accumulation of cells. We've come to understand when I started in medical oncology, I was taught that every cell had a risk of becoming cancerous. That's not true. We now know that every tissue in our body as a long lived animal, a mammal, we have regeneration. When you cut yourself, I cut myself this morning on my hand, I know it will heal over time, but that regeneration activates lineage specific cells of my skin to repopulate the tissue. And that duplication, because it is a genetic disease inherited in the DNA that you've talked about, it's those mutations that accumulate over life time that make cancer a disease of aging. And because we are constantly damaging ourselves and regenerating, we understand why things like tobacco smoke, like UV light or radiation, increase our risk because they damage DNA during that repair process. We understand why hepatitis B and hepatitis C cause liver cancer. We understand why HPV over a long time causes cervical cancer and head neck cancer, and we can build preventative strategies, HPV being one of the biggest opportunities going forward. We had to have a molecular understanding because it wasn't one organ. Every organ can get cancer, but it's the regenerative cells of that tissue that make a difference. That leads us to our last frontier of why all three of us continue to believe in freestanding cancer centers. We're terrific now at treating anybody whose cancer is caught early enough that it's only in the local organ, organ that it starts in. Peter's surgeons, Candace's surgeons, my surgeons, radiation oncology surgeons, any major cancer center, all of them that participate in the comprehensive outdoor can cure that person with the modalities they have. The problem is cancer metastasizes. And that's the last frontier. If we can understand why it is that cancers acquire the ability to metastasize, because it's not a simple mutation. We've now sequenced thousands of metastases. Yes, they have a little more diversity than the cancer, but there aren't oncogenes of metastasis. There aren't tumor suppressors of metastasis. And so we've got a whole new frontier because that's unfortunately why there's still residual cancer that we can't handle. And ultimately, when we understand the biology of that, we'll get to the future. And so we had this tremendous advance. It gave us precision medicine. Charles Sawyers, who leads the program here and his work on Gleevec with others at Peter's Institution, as well as at the, at the University of Oregon, really proved to us that understanding those mutations and treating for those mutations would give us better outcomes. And so the use of Gleevec and CML revolutionized the disease that I used to take care of and had fatality within 36 months. Now the cohort that they studied in a phase one study that was never closed, those patients are living longer than their age match controls as Brian Drucker continues to follow them at Oregon. And that's amazing that precision therapy delivered that. And then we understood that to be able to be successfully metastasized, they had to fool the police of our body, the immune cells, and that led to Jim Allison's insight about checkpoint blockade. Those are two revolutions that give us tools for the metastatic disease. So we can see melanoma be cured, lung cancer, which I never thought in my lifetime we'd see cured, but it doesn't work for everybody. So there's lots more we need to know. And that's both demonstrates the promise of things we didn't expect 
from the discovery of oncogenes and tumor suppressors in molecular detail with the sequencing of the human genome, and then the sequencing of cancer genomes compared to the germline. And then this discovery that the rest of the body is co-opted by the cancer cell and the metastasis problem. And if we can reactivate the COPS, we'll do well, but there's other cells involved in helping a tumor be successful that we've got to learn how to get them to stand down or fight back against the cancer, which has fooled them. And so there's a tremendous need for this network of comprehensive cancer to solve that problem and then deliver that answer in a way it can be practiced everywhere in the country for every oncologist, every patient, that has the disease. Dr. Johnson, you are a world-renowned pharmacologist, a drug <laughs> developer. Uh, what's the future of the Cancer Center and drug development? So, you know, drugs, have, I think drugs have taken a different turn than from when I started in this business because uh, they were all poisons uh, and they, uh, they were uh, their side effects. Uh, they're still they still have a place today, but I'd like to think that pharmacology we've gotten a little more sophisticated. And some of our drugs, uh, you know, uh, depending uh, pharmacologists uh, 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 would even say that a checkpoint inhibitor is a drug. Um, and there are pharmacologists that work on those sorts of areas. But I think the future for us is to uh, is more targeted therapy. You know, as uh, Craig said, um, you know, the genomic era has really offered us such an opportunity to identify uh, genomic signatures, uh, and there are really only about a handful of drugs uh, that recognize certain genomic signatures where you can, uh, you, you can actually see a response in a patient. Now, if you have that, if you find that gene, um, that where there is a, um, a, a companion drug for it, you have a good chance to see a response and it's a wonderful thing, um, but it's limited. And so I think there's lots of room for new drug development and for drugs that are attacking and looking um, only at that uh, spe specific target. So I think, you know, there's still a place. Pharmacologists, you know, in the old, old days when you'd go to um, an ASCO or an AACR meeting, there'd be lots of pharmacologists, lots of drug, drug uh, discovery efforts and so forth. And now it's all immunology. And uh, the pharmacologists are sort of sitting in the corner, but um, I think that uh, immunopharmacology is a really uh, important uh, area. And I think that uh, what all of us are doing in the uh, immune space, in the immunotherapy space is really exciting. I mean, we're seeing sort of the C word uh, cure in uh, patients that you just wouldn't have seen this before. So I think it's a, as, as we've all said, this is a very complex disease. We're not going to solve it with just drugs alone, and we're not going to solve it just with immun immunotherapy alone. Uh, we're, it's going to take all of this. Um, it's, a, it's a complex process. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Pisters, you're a surgeon. Uh, you already knew that, I guess. Uh, the um, minimally invasive surgery, uh, you know, when I first started in medicine in the 1980s, uh, surgery uh, caused a lot of morbidity, and there were efforts, uh, tremendous efforts to decrease morbidity from surgery, uh, limb sparing sarcoma surgeries and that sort of stuff. It seems like uh, surgery has progressed and minimally invasive surgery with robotics, with uh, scoping and that sort of stuff has uh, become more and more uh, on the forefront. Can you tell me just a little bit about cancer centers and developing those sorts of things and convincing the FDA and the American public that you really don't have to be totally unzipped in order to have a good colon cancer operation? Well, Otis, your, your question um, really makes the point that uh, minimally invasive surgery has transformed many aspects of surgical care, not just cancer surgery. Um, it was brought to cancer patients and done so in the ways that your question really illustrates that it really reduces morbidity. Um, it has comparable mortality rates where mortality is often driven by other comorbidities rather than the surgery itself. And over time, we've been able to demonstrate that um, oncologic outcomes in some, but not all cancers are comparable. And this has really created advantages. Uh, unfortunately, those advantages don't extend to cost uh, where 
um, increasingly the cost of the reusables associated with this drives up the cost of a given operation. And as we all become more cost focused, uh, this will become an issue um, over time. We also have seen uh, that in many cases across the nation, a lot of aspects of minimally invasive surgery have been driven by industry. And this has created a situation where there's been really a dearth of randomized data, uh, particularly in cancer. When you look closely at subsets of cancers and you look at randomized data or the trial that we led in gynecologic cancer, uh, we found contrary to the hypothesis uh, that patients who had open surgery had superior oncologic outcomes. And this was practice changing. It prompted lots of questions um, over time and really demonstrates the point that when new technology is introduced, particularly expensive technology, it has to be subject to randomized controlled trials that look at all aspects um, of the short-term morbidity, look at cost data, and look at oncology outcomes. Thank you, thank you. The cancer centers uh, as a group, the NCI designated cancer centers, have gotten a mandate to do community outreach and engagement recently. Now, the original National Cancer Act in 1971 told the NCI that it needed to do public education regarding cancer. And this COE or community outreach and engagement mandate is really a follow through of that. And it's actually manifested itself in a number of different ways. The three of you were co-signatories of a very powerful, incredibly powerful letter. I wish we had some similar thing for coronavirus vaccine. Uh, a letter encouraging every parent in the United States to get their children, boys and girls, vaccinated against HPV. Uh, just tell me a little bit about what your cancer centers are doing uh, for other aspects of education beyond that diet, exercise, smoking cessation, so forth. Just give us some examples of what your cancer centers are doing and, and what other cancer centers ought to be doing. I'll start with you, Candace. So, you know, it's, uh, we're in a, um, our catchment area is characterized by poverty, um, uh, obesity, smoking. Uh, we're the second poorest city in the country. Um, and so it's a, it's a real issue for us. We have uh, a large number of African-Americans, uh, Hispanics in our community, and also we have uh, the indigenous population. Uh, there are many, um, uh, Sen the Seneca reservations that are around our catchment area as well. And so uh, we really, it's, it's something that we really pay attention to. And I think that even before the community and engagement, um, uh, outreach and engagement component, of, of centers grants, uh, this was something that we put uh, center stage is reaching out to our community. I think that um, I applaud the NCI for focusing on this because um, it, and quite honestly, uh, many of our efforts that we've done in cancer really helped us to reach um, uh, uh, folks for COVID vaccines because they trusted us um, because we've, we've spent a lot of time in trying to develop trust in many of these groups that don't trust us, um, that it really, it's helped us uh, in so many ways, education, screening, and so forth. Um, we have, um, Christine Ambersoni leads a, a very distinguished group and is interested in molecular uh, risk factors in uh, breast cancer and has really reached out in the African uh, American community and collaborated with many centers around the country um, to look at uh, uh, a number of factors, including uh, breast, um, breastfeeding uh, as a, um, to decrease uh, mortality in breast cancer. But you know, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of, and in prostate cancer, we have uh, outreach um, uh, in many of our African-American communities here as well. Um, one of our faculty members is a member of the Seneca tribe. And he, uh, so we have a big uh, study in looking at obesity and um, trying to make connections uh, in the indigenous population. And, and I wanna tell you, it's a whole nother level of, of mistrust 
um, if, if you will. And so we've made great strides in helping to in our screening programs to get these folks in. I think that it's, it's one of the most positive things that we can do um, as, a, as a cancer center is to be that nidus, not only for screening, but for education as it relates to a whole variety of, of diet. I've already mentioned our, our um, footprint in smoking cessation, but now that's also expanded into, I mean, vaping, which is a, a huge problem and looking at uh, the effects uh, and it's not without its, its issues. Um, and so I think that uh, the community outreach and engagement has really made our centers, they, you know, we talk about <clears throat> those of you that know about the CCSG, <clears throat> excuse me, the depth to be a comprehensive center, you have to have depth and breadth across all of the, uh, across basic science, clinical and population science and education. And I think the community outreach and engagement really has given all of our centers depth and breadth because it's really um, uh, shine, it shines a light on these so, so important things that we do for our communities. So I could go on and on, but I'll turn it over to Craig or, or Peter. So I'll just pick up where Candace said. I think each of us um, serve major cities. As Candace said, um, she was when she when their center started, Roswell Park started, it was the third largest city in America and had a booming economy. As it as as small industry has moved away, she's faced the economic challenges. Yes. For us, we are still the largest city. We have 34 million people within a hundred miles of me right now. So that's one in 10 Americans. And we have to serve to get through that whole diversity. So for rare cancers, things like that. But in terms of the outreach to the community, Otis, the critical things that we've seen that we uniquely can do are some of our aspects of immigrant health and cancer disparities that Fran Ganey lives. We have a very active program that reaches out into the Hispanic community that's moving up from the Caribbean, from Central and Latin America, and, and reaching out because they don't have that kind of cancer information that they need. So we have a big program in getting HPV vaccine into that community. Signing that letter didn't impact that community as much as I would like to have. So we have a, a, a terrific program around that. We have a huge obesity problem that cancer, Candace mentioned, um, and it is socioeconomic because across America, America is the fattest nation. And today, it's at least in our city, tobacco is not the number one preventable cause of cancer. It's actually obesity, type two diabetes, and poor diet and lack of exercise related cancers as seen by the statistics published by the National Cancer Institute. So I, I was really proud um, among we could all talk about ratings, but I was really proud of our the recent ratings come out from the U.S. News and World Report because we're 18th in the country in our diabetes program because we need to understand why is this cancer incidence going up in the obese population to serve our community. But at the other end of the spectrum, because of the socioeconomic challenges that Candace said, we have a huge number of patients we deliver care that are food insecure. So we have a hospital-based food security program to make sure our patients have the nutrition to successfully get through their therapies. We reach out and make sure that all of our patient population is doing that. For prevention strategies, we've learned, as I said earlier, to partner. So right now for our, in Northern New Jersey, we've got to get people back to their cancer screening. We have a public service message announcement going out with our, PAC, with our partner there, Hackensack Medical Center, they have 20 hospitals that serve all of Northern Jersey. They have the screening facilities. We have that imprimatur to say, you have to go and do that. Those partnerships with all the community-based organizations really work to get the word out on our community. And then finally, COVID has allowed us to reconnect because in fact, cancer exposed to a greater risk to COVID. We reached out to the communities at request of New York City to stand up vaccine centers with our colleagues in Harlem, we partnered with the Abyssinian Baptist Church, tremendously successful program that's vaccinated over 10,000 people that were otherwise vaccine hesitant. Reverend Butts has been amazing in leading that program. And we were proud to be a nation center where the first lady, Dr. Biden, came to visit with Tony Fauci to, to actually talk about why we had to be engaged in the communities. We're really proud of those efforts. 
we'll never be able to, I mean, we'll keep doing as many as we can, but connecting with the community, becoming that trusted authority, which COVID has allowed us to reinvigorate because of our response is something that all the cancer centers really do embrace. But each of our, set, each of our areas and the service we can provide is unique. And it's different as we talked about for a matrix center, which has a public health school and primary care network versus a, a, a comprehensive cancer center that needs partnership to get to those primary care givers or the dentists that I talked about earlier. So just, just to add a little bit to uh, what Candace and Craig have said, uh, and for our international audience, um, I think COE is a uniquely American adaptation to changes and interventions that have occurred in the jurisdictional level in other developed countries that have single payer systems. Um, other developed countries that have better health outcomes than the United States use a jurisdictional approach to cancer prevention and screening. That's what we had in Ontario with Cancer Care Ontario, an entire provincial agency that sent letters to everyone in the, in the province at a moment in time when you needed to have colorectal cancer screening or a mammogram. And what we've done instead for a variety of reasons related to structural issues in the American healthcare system, we've created this construct of COE as a best practice or as an adaptation to try to extend prevention and screening benefits as well as anti-cancer uh, anti living benefits to larger populations, not just those who enter um, our organizations. So it would be important for us at a policy level to learn lessons from other countries that are frankly better at this than we are. Yeah. I, I wanna double down on what Peter said because that international program for us in New York, if you, we look at the patients that come to our hospital to be able to adequately inform them of their healthcare, we need to engage with them in their primary language. In yeah. many parts of America, that will be English and increasingly Spanish. For us, we have five languages where more than 5% of our patients, it's their primary language at home. And so learning to get that content and how to communicate it, we can do from our international collaborators to learn how to interact in different dialects of Spanish. We've used the UN, a unique resource we have to do reverse translation because just translating in one direction, you often don't, when it's reverse translated, you didn't say what you meant to say. And language, because America is this great melting pot of diversity, language is something we have not embraced enough in explaining the complexities of, can of cancer to patients so they feel comfortable with the authority that we're providing. So language is a huge barrier in the metropolitan areas of the United States, but I think it's everywhere. Every community has a language of the immigrant population that came there, right? But you know, Craig, even in Buffalo, and we're a very yeah. small market, we, we have over 70, uh, we translate over 70 different languages and have capabilities for that. It's, it's difficult. Um, but you have to be able to do it. It's so, so important. And it, it increasingly, we could draw on an international community where they have that language content and we could adopt it because yeah. many times that reverse trail, we were shocked when we started this reverse translation system that our translation into these eyes, we have 80, like Candace, 85 languages we provide interpreter services. But when you translated it back, it didn't come back exactly in what the first English version was. So we, we have lots to learn in the community delivery of that care and our messaging and our prevention strategies. And that's why we need to engage the community and provide research into what makes a difference. Because for us, the biggest disparity thing that drives disparity is not understanding and it's that language barrier. Now the um, NCI doesn't call this community outreach and engagement, but I think it's one thing that cancer centers might be able to do. Can, can you speak to what you're doing to influence how people are treated in your catchment area who don't come to the cancer center? You know, whether they get, uh, how doctors are recommending uh, mammography screening or how doctors dose chemotherapy or how doctors might even perform operations or when. Are the cancer centers really involved in trying to drive quality of care? I, and here I'm thinking about your involvement with NCCN as well. And so one of you may want to explain to the population here what NCCN is. 
just maybe I can just start uh, this one just with um, our example. Um, Houston is situated in Harris County and Harris County, Texas has the largest number of uninsured citizens in the country, 1 million. And what we've done is to look at the county hospitals and to partner. We have two county hospitals, Ben Top and LBJ. Uh, Baylor College of Medicine provides oncology care at Bentop and MD Anderson provides oncology care at LBJ Hospital. And the way we've done that is to really bring the doctors to the patients. And so our faculty have a clinic at LBJ. Um, we provide the services um, there at our standards with our doctors. And we bring increasingly our clinical trials to that environment so we can enroll a larger population a much more diverse population of individuals into our clinical trials. We're working now with the UT system to increase our investment and build an MD Anderson facility at LBG, LBJ Hospital with donor support and with support from the University of Texas uh, Board of Regents. So I'm really excited um, about these changes. It's an excellent example of what other cancer centers can do to really make a material difference in their own regions. Yeah, I mean, NCCN has really played a huge role in standardizing things uh, across this country. And all of us are members uh, of NCCN uh, on this panel uh, to improve quality uh, across the board. Um, it, we also try with uh, pathway-driven care to try to um, uh, standardize the way uh, some of our uh, physicians in the community. And, you know, sometimes that is, that's embraced and sometimes it's not. But um, I think that I think we owe it to our community to be the leaders and be the sort of the, the gatekeeper, if you will, of this of high quality care uh, at every turn. So I think it is a really important thing that we do. Right. So I'll just double down on NCCN, which is where the comprehensive centers came together to yes. set common standards so that everyone, 85 percent of oncology care is still given in community hospitals throughout the nation and to have a standard reference to go back to have a compendium of recommended therapy that is kept constantly updated is what nccn has done and that's been a great offshoot of the comprehensive cancer center uh, uh network i i do want to say that the biggest hit that we've seen in COVID and our mission has actually been our ability to serve as the cme center for cancer in our catchment area we never had a, a week go by without at least two groups of three or 400 physicians coming to be re-educated on their part of cancer to this institution. I'm sure Peter and Candace would say the same thing. And we haven't been able to convene them. And it's not the same thing as them coming and talking to our experts, finding out that insight, understanding why that new treatment makes a difference. That communication, when immunotherapy came, the average person didn't know how to deal with the side effects. That was the way we communicated it and that ability to come together with CME, we've all got to reinvent. And then I just wanna to speak to something Candace mentioned and, and Peter reminded me of, which is that we have a huge and a wonderful, you heard a lot about from them of safety net hospitals in this city that in COVID were amazing in how they stood up care. We partnered with them to take their cancer patients who did shouldn't be exposed to COVID. It was a great partnership. They, but the real important long lasting thing is that those, those safety net hospitals don't have the molecular testing that allows them to decide whether they can achieve NCN guidelines because they don't have the molecular testing. And so Dr. Carol Brown, who, who is our uh, chief health equity officer has been standing up programs in partnership with health and hospitals to get those people tested through our impact testing. Those people that get a cancer diagnosis now hospitals can find out if they're eligible for a clinical trial, if they, had, if, if they can get that molecular testing. And we have that in a number of pilot programs in Queens, in Brooklyn, throughout the city to be able to do that. That's where we become that authority that, Can that Candace is talking about. We have to make those trials available to everybody, the latest recommendations. You have to have the diagnostics right to do that. And that's where we are falling down and why we've got to convince the federal government that molecular testing is the right way forward with cancer. That's not yet fully approved in terms of reimbursement. Cancer centers have always had a lot of political support uh, 
one of my old bosses when I was at the NCA, NCI, an NCI director used to always say, the thing about cancer centers is every one of them has two senators and at least one congressman. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that uh, cancer centers are gonna be removed from the NCI budget in the near future. Uh, but we still have a pay line that's hovering between nine and 10%. I worry about the investigators who work in the cancer centers. Uh, how are we going to fund the future? How are we gonna keep young people in research? I, I, I ask this question knowing that the three of you do an amazing job of finding alternative streams of money to support young investigators. But how long can we keep doing this? And, and what, what are some of the ways, just tell, you might want to mention some of the ways that you've been working to support young investigators. Because I don't think uh, many people outside of the community of cancer center executives know uh, the work that you do, the hard work that you do to support, especially young investigators. I'm talking about the people who are in their 30s who are, you know, just building their career. Um, I mean, I can start. I'm the small fry here. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we I, I actually think Buffalo, Roswell Park, uh, we're sometimes the last bastion of the clinician scientist because uh, the young clinician, uh, scientist, uh, we really try to incentivize them and support them early on in their career, uh, especially to sort of push that translational sort of envelope, uh, as well as our basic scientists, um, uh, the young folks who get very discouraged at a 9% um, uh, pay line, that's for sure. Um, our philanthropy, you know, uh, is a lot smaller, I'm sure, than, than my uh, colleagues on the, on the panel, but you, we do a really incredible job um, at raising money um, in Buffalo. And we use that philanthropy uh, very judiciously to help support some of these programs and to help uh, give some of these young uh, individuals a chance uh, for pilot studies uh, to be able to, get, to garner uh, bigger and more uh, 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 comprehensive grants from uh, the NIH or um, NCI or DOD with uh, other mechanisms. But it is, it is a challenge. We also uh, utilize our clinical revenues to help support our research mission. Uh, hence why it's so important for us uh, to uh, drive that um, because it helps to fund um, uh, these young investigators. But you have to be committed to it. Um, and I think uh, cancer centers are the place to do this. And I know my colleagues agree with me. Um, it, we can't it's what distinguishes us, our innovation and our ability to generate um, these incredible discoveries is what distinguishes us from a non-NCI designated cancer, and you know, a, a cancer center who is more of a community center. That's what designates us and, so, uh, and distinguishes us. And so I think it's really important that we don't lose that. Uh, and it will become more and more of a challenge, Otis, you're exactly right, as we go forward, because those dollars are gonna be harder and harder to come by. I think that um, just to add briefly to what Candace said, as we think about it and our diverse faculty, it, it's very important that we value um, all contributions to the mission. Uh, research is very important. It's a very important component of our societal contributions. And we wanna create dedicated, protected time uh, for a subset of our faculty who engage in research. We wanna give them all the resources, all the time, access to the platforms. And then as we talk about it internally, we make investments in three specific areas to fuel the kind of production that we need and to enhance the ability to come above the pain line. One of them is investment in talent, uh, where we're recruiting the right kind of collaborators. Second area is investment in partnerships. Um, very important academic partnerships illustrated recently by Breakthrough Cancer and industry partnerships that are very, very important to our research community. And the last area of investment, uh, very important, is the facilities and infrastructure. Um, not just cores. Uh, I'm talking about ideation space, new research buildings, different way of allocating space um, over time so that highly productive researchers get rewarded for that and they get more space over time. 
and that we help researchers who, for whatever set of reasons and circumstances, can't achieve reasonable research productivity to find other ways to contribute to our mission. So it's really understanding that not everyone needs to be engaged in wet lab based research. Those who are engaged need to be supported in every possible way so that they can be successful with the investments and the talent, the partnerships and the infrastructure. Yeah, so I'll just re-echo what both uh, Peter and Candace said. I, we have a big program to fund at the junior investigator level, new pilot ideas, new grant ideas that will give them the opportunity and the resources to be able to develop a portfolio of results at every level, whether it's basic translational clinical science to move forward to getting funding from a federal agency or a patient interest group. And uh, those funds are absolutely essential for success at the junior level, to have that chance, that satisfaction that you can investigate your own new idea. The new thing is what Peter said, translational research is the mantra of today, demonstrating it can happen. That's much more team-based. You need to bring together the expertise. That means we have to have promotion systems that recognize people are going to share the credit. It's not what the movies show us as one doctor sitting in a laboratory coming up with something. And so we have to change the standards of team-based research, of embedded investigators, junior in their career, so that they can explore their ideas in the framework of a larger group of people working on that. So team-based science, collaborative science is really something we're pushing hard to support our junior investigators and get them to understand the complexity of bo modern biomedical research. Now, what about investigator-initiated research versus directed research? There's um, increasingly, I'm seeing, you know, for, for the audience, uh, over the last 50 years, a lot of our learning has come about because people in the laboratory or groups of people in laboratories at cancer centers, universities, have written grants, sent them to the NIH, said, this is my idea and this is why it should be funded. That's an investigator initiated grant. Uh, more and more, there are movements by certain elements to have more directed research, where some smart person somewhere says, I want to give you money to do this or that. Um, are you seeing, I, I think this is becoming more and more prevalent. Are you seeing this? And do you think this is a good idea? Because we've learned an awful lot through investigator initiated research in terms of what's going on in the cancer cell. And I've even gone off and said, uh, for example, the mRNA vaccines for coronavirus, they weren't created in six months. It was huge investments in basic research over several decades that all came together and happened to be applied in a short period of time to develop those vaccines. Uh, but it was primarily investigator initiated research that brought us then, I'm talking too much. Do you see a problem here? So, so Otis, let me just speak to this because in, in researching, and this is relevant to the history project, um, one of the real debates in what started the National Cancer Act was the commission that took place in the Senate as Nixon came in and Johnson left. Mary Lasker convinced the Senate to have, along with Sidney Farber, to have a commission that looked at what should happen in cancer. The biggest debate in Congress, if you read those records, was whether the new money should be a contract or a grant. And thank goodness the scientific community stood up and said, it cannot be a contract. This is not just delivering these number of doses. We need to investigate the science of this and to have those investigator initiated ideas and a way to do that. It's a time where that debate's happening again. And it's what you said. And so I think we need to take, look at what happened for that 50 years because we stuck to the idea that these are grants, that people are, get to follow their new hypothesis-driven idea with the new tools of science, with the new tools of medicine. And we have to really double down that. And we need to use collectively our authority as cancer centers to say this is critical in driving cancer forward and keeping the talent that's involved in our education, our training missions as we go forward. 
Agree totally. Yeah, Peter? I think that um, it's, it's very important for us um, in each of our organizations, and I presume colleagues across the country and around the world are trying to find the sweet spot. In other words, you need to support a curiosity-based discovery research, exemplified as Craig said, uh, by Jim Allison's work on the fundamental biology of the immune system and how it could be used for cancer. Uh, that's had massive impact on society. You also need to see the opportunities that are created with team-based science. And that when we solve for a problem like uh, breast cancer or glioblastoma by putting research teams together from different institutions or partnering with industry, team-based science creates tremendous benefit. The poster child for team-based science on a foundation of curiosity-based science that you point out, Otis, was the development of the COVID vaccine. And so we need in our institutions to have both. And really the, the challenge is to define the sweet spot so that individuals feel like they can pursue their own hypothesis-driven ideas in a rich resource-based environment and other individuals or perhaps the same individuals at different points in their careers can join teams that are doing great things together. It's wonderful. I'm gonna ask a couple of the questions here and anybody who wants to add into the Q&A session, please go ahead. Uh, one person who worked for the NCI uh, said that they've witnessed examples of discretionary resources being directed toward achievement of uh, uh, cancer center metrics. Uh, rather than toward the most exciting science. Uh, that's their opinion. Uh, do you have suggestions for improving the NCI designation process? Anybody? I hope we go back to in-person site visits. <laughs> well, I, I've done a bunch of those site visits and it's difficult to sort of get the chemistry of the team. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I... I I don't want to joke around. Obviously, this uh, the person that asked the question. Um, I, I I would like to think at our center that we don't spend re if it's directed towards a CCSG metric, it's actually going to help the institution and it's going to incentivize the best science. So I, I don't know uh, the specifics of that question, but I think that most of us the metrics actually are positive ones to that we achieve. Yeah, I, I will say having sat near the, f the front office at the NCI, there is a concern about unfunded mandates on the part of the NCI. There's a desire not to uh, do unfunded mandates. And there are oftentimes pressures uh, for certain mandates that from places you would never, never dream of. Uh, uh, from one of our Canadian friends, uh, please comment on the Cancer Center's global mandate. Should the U.S. model be replicated in every country around the world? And what's the nature of Cancer Center's, uh, 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 U.S. Cancer Center's global mandate? Well, you know, I can start out. We have, uh, we, we are probably not as global uh, outreach as uh, uh, my uh, panelists, but uh, I think it is important uh, for us to um, uh, have, uh, be in the global scene. They have a lot to offer to us. We have a longstanding collaboration with Cuba um, and um, uh, the Cubans are really an incredible group of scientists and have achieved much um, with, very little. And so I think we at Roswell Park have been enriched through our collaborations. And I think we are bringing uh, things to Cuba and they are bringing things to us. Uh, we have some outreach in uh, Africa where there's much needed, uh, much needed attention to uh, quality and care for those individuals and in uh, the Caribbean and so forth. So I think a global presence is really important for every NCI designated center. Um, and so, because I think it enriches, it's just like diversity, it enriches us um, and it enriches them because you're bringing a different culture and you're, you're learning more things about them. So, yeah. so you guys I, I, a lot. I think all of our, I just want to echo what Candace said and not talk about specific programs. All of us and everyone in our centers wants to reduce to practice advances in cancer prevention, 
diagnosis and treatment that won't be just practiced at our center, but will be adopted are capable of being adopted for every one of the 8 million cancer victims every year throughout the world. And, but what we have to appreciate and which has been a very important part of our international program is that there are cultural differences in how people approach health. And we need to be sensitive to that and, and knowledgeable about that. And that means a partner that is involved in the primary delivery of care throughout the world. So our global missions are almost always in partnership in all the continents where we have major programs to find a partner hospital similarly dedicated to elevating the quality across their nation or their regions cancer care and deliver that in a culturally sensitive way that actually makes a meaningful difference. And we can become, as I just said, as we do in the US in our local region, we become the authority that they can exercise to say, here's the, sen here's the science of it. Here's how we can adopt it within our healthcare system to make a difference. Because ultimately it, uh, all three of us and the cancer centers um, that are in the conference center are, are incredibly proud of the quality we deliver to the individual patients to come to our care. But that's only a small fraction of the US cancer patients that we need to help and the international patients because cancer is a disease in every country in the world. And so we really want to understand how to best do that. And I, this is an unfinished mandate, but one thing we need to do is share best practices and learning how to do that. And we will often learn as much as we give back for the language issues that I talked about before, for understanding what often that partnership says you guys are too academic. You have too many visits that have to be done in a clinical trial. We could do it with four and we learn to get simpler and that's more patient centric and more focused. So the partnerships are good when they are a partnership with the primary caregivers of cancer delivery throughout the world in our global initiatives. Otis, this is a great topic uh, for discussion. And uh, in fact, the question you pose is one that was part of our strategic planning conversations in many, many meetings. And it comes from experience that we have. We operate a cancer center in Madrid. We do work in partnership in sub-Saharan Africa. And the net result of our strategic planning conversations is that we reach the conclusion that single institutional efforts are highly inefficient and that our resource, resources are probably best allocated in partnership with the WHO, with the UICC, where we can come together and take full advantage of their talent, their infrastructure, their footprint in some of these uh, areas of the world where there's massive unmet need. So I think as you see us moving forward, you'll see us working to expand our partnerships with organizations that already have a global health mandate and helping them uh, with oncology care delivery and new ways of extending prevention and screening into the developed world. Mm -hmm. Question, uh, do you each, does each institution have an institutional historian, number one? If so, uh, do you know what year you became an NCI designated comprehensive cancer center? Did you have to apply? And was there peer review and what did peer review look like at that time? I should point out to the people who asked those questions that all four of us were not in grade school when this happened. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I could start. So we don't know the exact year. Um, we've tried to find it. We were one of the first. We did not have, because we were, you know, as uh, I've said before, we were a large uh, city for its size. Um, uh, we had preeminence of this uh, longstanding cancer center. And so we got designation without even applying. And we were one of the first of just a handful of centers that got designated uh, initially. Um, we were also, when we did have an application, we were one of the first uh, folks to get comprehensive status officially and so forth. So, uh, but we do have an historian on our staff, uh, Roswell Park, as you could well imagine. I mean, this, I don't know if you guys can see this. This is a tobacco box that was Roswell Parks. It sits on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's a, I don't use it for tobacco anymore. 
<laughs> but we have a lot of his uh, his desk, his um, uh, the the uh, file folder, uh, X-ray folder, all wood, very beautiful furniture, still sits um, at Roswell Park. We have it where people can look at it. We have many. We have his death mask. We have archives of records and documents. And so we have, yes, we have an historian uh, who pays attention to all these things. So uh, very rich history here. So I, I will say I, I envy Candace. We do not have an historian per se, but we have a tremendous library service with a number of people uh, with PhDs in information science. So they're good at finding that, and we have tremendous archives that we keep uh, of our uh, that that we can draw from the records. So I can tell you that our first grant that is a cancer center grant was the one I talked about in 1964 uh, that our our team was able to drag out. What I understand is that there were three outcomes that were relevant to us for the National Cancer Act. The first was that the chair of our board became the head of the National Cancer Advisory Board. That was Benno Schmidt because Lawrence Rockefeller didn't want to serve. Um, so that's the historical record. And he nom nominated Benno Schmidt and Mary Lasker and Richard Nixon picked him to be the first head of the National Cancer advisory board, which started as part of the Cancer Act to oversee this issue and continues to oversee the NCI. Um, it allowed three cancer centers, because the, in the act, it was anticipated that there would be comprehensive cancer centers. Three cancer centers passed through until 1973 to actually be the founding ones without a further application. And the current directors who were in grade school then are Candace Peter and myself, because we represent those three institutions, they were already considered without an application to do that. That doesn't mean every five years since then we've had to do it. No, it doesn't. Exactly, <laughs> but, but we were allowed to do that. And the one thing that I just wanna say, cause it's very proud part of our tradition that Benno Schmidt brought as part of the NCAB, cause there was great concern. What you may not know, is that the director of HEW, which is where the NCI was under at that time, was against the National Cancer Act. And there was a large number of really high quality scientists, some of whom ultimately were chosen to go into the NCAB, who believed because cancer didn't have this physiology history, that the money would be wasted on trying to do things that were too close to the clinic and not fundamentally grounded in science. And the one thing that happened for every center and it came because Mary Lasker timed the National Cancer Act ask perfectly. You may not know this, but she started the ask immediately after the landing on the moon. And she said, this is the next thing we're gonna do. It was the way we channeled the excitement of the excitement of going to the moon at Kennedy launched into the launch into the Cancer Act and every center increased their funding over the next decade. And so not only did basic science funding because they were grants increase for cancer, not only did cancer center grants happen, but it raised the molecular biology revolution and the US's ability to lead it in every discipline because Congress got the message that this was an opportunity. So it's a tremendous celebration that this 50 years of what it's delivered. And that delivery I'm proud to say happened at, in every field because cancer touches every organ. So the other institutes that are dedicated to organ specific disease benefited as well. And we're really proud in our history with our role in that around Benno Schmidt's role in the first NCAB and, and making that message clear to Congress as he did. We're very much like um... Sloan Kettering in the sense that we don't have a historian, but we do have archives and excellent librarians. I, I think the flip side to your question, Otis, is um, a lot of old history can really be put together with memos and letters um, that are in paper files. And now we've moved to a digital environment. Um, I'm completely paperless myself. And every now and then um, I'm wondering, well, how is the history? of this period ever going to be documented because um, it's in a bunch of deleted emails. Um, it's on a bunch of servers. Um, how are we going to take the archivists of the modern era and help them to chronicle today's history? That's a really, really good point. We have a book that I have to mention that's pretty special. So it was a bound book that had 
blank pages in it. Roswell Park started it. So it starts back in 1898. And every time a visitor came and gave a seminar, you signed or a dignitary or something. And so um, we still have that book and, and we, we're not using it for people that are coming now anymore for seminars because we want to preserve it. But it's to page through it. It's remarkable the people that came through and it's a, it's a very treasured uh, item. So I think it's important to, to I, I agree with Peter, to, we don't want to lose our past. We have 10 minutes left. Uh, there's a couple of questions here about what are your cancer centers doing to advance health equity or what are you doing to overcome health disparities? I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and say that I believe that that's not just the cancer center's obligation. That's more of a global obligation for society at large. And I'll even invoke my own personal belief that the cancer centers have done a lot more uh, than a lot of other people in terms of this. But anyway, let me give you the opportunity uh, to address that. And at the same time, because this is probably the last time we go around, what do you expect for the future of the cancer center? I don't know who wants to go first. Um, I, I can go first. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things uh, we've, we've talked about some of the things that we're doing in our for our disparate populations across the board and, and all both Peter and Craig, uh, we've all done um, and, and Otis is exactly right. It is it's sort of the mantra of an NCI designated center. But I have to tell you, uh, the recent times um, with uh, what's happened in our country um, uh, has made me reflect even more on this. And um, because I don't think it's I don't think it's enough just to go into our community and uh, do the kinds of community engagement kind of things that we're doing as it relates to CCSG. Um, I think that uh, the way we're going to um, really make connections is we have to we have to have more physicians, nurses that are African American or Indigenous population or LGBT. We need to uh, be more, we need, you know, all of our centers are very diverse. Um, that's the thing I love about this field is you meet people from all over the world, diverse backgrounds, religions, gender, everything. Um, and it really adds to the richness of each one of our organizations, but we don't, but we could do more. And I think that I've been very sensitive to uh, trying to make sure that Roswell Park is a place of inclusion uh, where people can come here and feel safe and be able not only to work here, but uh, also to be treated here. And I think it goes to, it's a little bit bigger than just uh, some of the community engagement things that we have. And I think it's, a, I think it's an important, I, I feel a responsibility uh, in this area in our community. So I'll, I'll just echo what Candace said. I think uh, the recent events have reminded us of how important is part of healthcare delivery that people come to see commonality with their caregivers so that they feel that trust, that convenience that we're seeing that's driving vaccine hesitancy and other things about. Um, we were proud we already had a chief diversity officer and across our whole workforce, we do mirror New York. And we're very proud of that. We needed to reach out to the populations that were underserved in every way, shape and form in New York to even greater extent than we've talked about an example. I was very pleased that last summer we were able to have Carol Brown take our chief health equity officer position that we started as part of this to in redouble our efforts as Candace just said. Um, we though needed to understand that we don't have enough diversity in our senior ranks, particularly of our physicians and our senior researchers. We are not as diverse as the community we serve and we need to do better. So we have tremendous programs that quite honestly, the cancer letter has profiled in the last bit of time about our educational mission at high school, at college. They, they reach out to diverse communities, but we also needed to do that at the top of the organization. Yes. We've done that for women, more than 50% of our leadership is now uh, female. So that we're nice, that's worked nicely over the last decade, but it doesn't mirror the rest of the diversity that we need to achieve. And so we 
have asked and had um, our diversity council that we stood up um, that represents all aspects of it, set real stretch goals about how we as a leadership match the diversity of our community. We are going to do our best to match that. I think this was, as Candace said, a wake up call for all of us that we were not doing enough. But as you've said, Otis, um, this, is, this is central to our mission. If we're gonna get the trust of the community to drive cancer care forward, to have people take prevention strategies, which they'll never know whether they worked or not, we've gotta be able to represent them in every way in which they feel we are, we are their community. And that's what we'll do over the next few years. Peter? Yeah, just to build on what my colleagues have said, I think that you know, as we formulated our strategic plan, we spent a lot of time looking at these societal issues and things such as our carbon footprint or a commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion received tremendous internal discussion during the process of co-creating our strategic plan. With respect to DEI, what we didn't want as a landing spot was an archipelago of tiny initiatives within the organization that could be at the subunit level or in an academic department, but we needed an institutional approach by building it into our strategic plan. We know that resources will be allocated. There'll be an executive committee that reports to me with defined metrics, and we can really drive change that's meaningful um, over time. As we really look at the issues of health disparity. We have an entire academic department that's focused on the elimination of disparities that is very, very important to us. And we want to really conduct systematic research to better understand the drivers of, of disparity and what our role is in addressing those gaps. So I think that the issues that our country has faced um, in the aftermath of George Floyd, a lot of the discussions that have taken place and the COVID pandemic have highlighted the disparities that are present in our own country and have really galvanized academic medical centers around the country to really lean in on this topic. We know how important it is to our workforce. We know how important it is to our community. Houston is the most diverse city in the United States. We need to reflect that diversity. We need to embrace that diversity. And we need to define how we're going to get all elements of diversity and inclusion. Diversity and inclusion are not the same. Um, diversity is a descriptive fact. Inclusion requires acts and deliberate acts and strategy. And that's the conversation that we've had as we embark on a big institutional effort on DEI. We only have a couple of minutes left. And the issue of uh, disparities, uh, one element is cost. Costs are going crazy. I prescribed a drug yesterday and the patient told me that uh, it was $15,000 a month for his oral medication. Uh, how are we going to overcome is, we don't have time for that. Tell me, are you optimistic? And if so, why? Overcoming disparities, overcoming costs, getting increased access. Are you optimistic? Yes or no? And if, if yes, why? Yes, because I will answer it immediately. I'm a very optimistic person and I know the challenges are great and cost is, is a big one. And that's a whole, we could spend a whole nother two hours just on that. Um, but I'm optimistic that the future is bright for us and we will find a way. And um, I think some exciting things are gonna be coming around. I think science, I think there's so much exciting out there right now that I think I'm very optimistic the future for us uh, in cancer, in so, cancer investigation, please. So I'm of two minds. I, I like Candace think that the science and the advances are gonna deliver and the healthcare costs of actually being in the hospital or receiving chemotherapy um, it shouldn't be that there's a higher copay for an oral medication when you don't need infusion and you can do that, Otis, as you just pointed out. I think that's going to happen and it's going to quickly come down. Right now, the costs are too high. What I am worried about is the financial toxicity as we recover from COVID and we go through all this that are not part of the healthcare costs. To get the best out of cancer care right now, you need a caregiver. You need somebody else that can take it. And a family that's living close to the poverty line, that's losing two incomes if both 
both members of the household work, the caregiver and the patient with the disease. We find the financial toxicities of loss of time from work, loss of pay, the, the cost of transportation, of food security are, are really the, the, the thing we are gonna have to struggle with going forward. We have institutional resources for all of those, but they are just not sufficient to meet the toxicity of people um, that are facing as they face a cancer diagnosis right now. And oddly, the government rules don't allow us to supplement on certain levels, as you may know. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Pisters? Well, um, Otis, let me just say the obvious. I am wildly optimistic. Um, when you look at these uh, four of us on this panel discussion today, it's accurate to say we've all been in this business for decades. And the reality is that the last decade has been like no other decade in our professional lives. When you look at the strength of uh, our institutions, you look at 51 comprehensive cancer centers across the United States, there couldn't be a better time to be in oncology. The kind of innovations, the discovery, the amazing things that are going to happen in the next 10 years, I can't wait to see it happen. Yeah. I'm just going to end by saying, you know, I saw a guy yesterday. He's had stage four non-small cell lung cancer for 12 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I would have thought that possible 20 yeah. years ago. I know, amazing, I know. Yeah. Yeah. This has been a great conversation. I wanna thank Dr. Candace Johnson of Roswell mm -hmm. Park, Dr. Peter Pisters of MD Anderson and Dr. Craig Thompson of Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. I wanna thank you, uh, not just for being the leaders of incredible cancer centers, but for being uh, incredible uh, scientists and for your contributions and also being incredible personal friends of mine. Uh, I wanna thank you uh, and uh, it's, have a good evening. Uh, this is a recording for the Cancer History Project and it'll be available on cancerhistoryproject.com. I want to thank Dr. Uh, Katie Goldberg, who has orchestrated this whole thing. And I want to acknowledge my partner in the Cancer History Project, the co-editor, Paul Goldberg. So good evening, folks. Thank you, Otis. It was a privilege Thanks, for Otis. all of us to participate. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Craig. Peter, great to see you. Take care, all.